Hello and welcome to Continental Prime, reaching you from our studios in Lagos, Nigeria's economic capital. I'm Suleiman Aled. The headlines for this are Youth of Ghana's opposition NDC party demand better governance with Matt for Justice protest. South Africa's former president Jacob Zuma to wait till Friday to know if he will be arrested after being sentenced for contempt of court. Tunisia to buy 3.5 million doses of Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccines. Details shortly. Well, the news begins in Ghana, we are protesting youth of the opposition National Democratic Congress on Tuesday, July 6, uh, have submitted a petition to the presidency after their March for Justice demonstration. The national youth organizer of the party, George Okpari Adu, led some party members to present the petition at the seat of government. The deputy chief of staff in charge of operations, Emmanuel Bosman, who received the petition, assured the group that a document would be presented to President Nana Kufuadu. The group also presented a copy of the petition to Parliament. Now joining me is our correspondent, uh, Bereth Joseph, who is live in Ghana. Well, I understand that. Well, uh, Bereth isn't ready yet. Uh, pretty much later, we'll go back to, uh, we'll get to Bereth, who's live in Ghana, to give us update on that situation in uh, Ghana. Uh, to other news now, uh, some pirates in neighboring Togo, nine pirates who tried to hijack a ship off the coast of Togo two years ago have been given prison terms ranging from 12 to 20 years. The pirates comprised seven Nigerians, two Togolese and one Ghanaian. They were accused of attacking an oil tanker. Reports say the Togolese pirate is on the run and faces an international arrest warrant. This is the first time pirates have been tried in Togo. My Nigeria parliament has condemned the unlawful arrest of its citizens by security personnel from the neighboring Republic of Benin. Now, while reacting to a motion raised by a fellow lawmaker informing Nigeria's Senate on the activities of the Benin security agencies at the country's border communities. Members of the parliament say the continued harassment of Nigerians must be brought to an end. They asked the Senate to pass a resolution mandating the government of the Republic of Benin to respect the rights of Nigerians. Mr. President, recall the numerous reports of alleged encroachments into Nigeria's territory by authorities of, the, of our country's neighbor, the Republic of Benin, which has become increasingly alarming and disturbing. Further note that these allegations of encroachment have been so also flayed by the government of the state as published in a release from the state government calling on the federal government to immediately secure the release of Nigerian citizens currently languishing in detention in the Republic of Benin as a result of their resistance to the continued encroachment. Aware that the continuous unchecked egress and egress of persons are the different entry points and borders between Nigeria and the Republic of Benin, the country's closest neighbor, are likely the result of the policy of our, of our country's borders. This action by the government and agents of the Republic of Benin are capable of causing huge arrest and can lead to mass action against citizens residing in both countries. Nigerians are being treated anyhow by nations of this world. And I think it's high time this nation must rise and protect their citizens. Every citizen of Nigeria must be treated with dignity and respect by any nation in this world. Nigeria is not a pushover. And Nigeria is not an ordinary country. The Republic of Benin, as uh, this is without any intention to belittle them, as uh, tiny as they are, 
if I can use that word. Every now and again, you will see them harassing the great Nigeria, the big brother. And that is why we are shouting, we've been shouting, we will continue to do that about even the Tongiji Island, which is in Nigeria territory. As we speak today, except for what maybe the Nigerian government is doing now, Tongiji Island will go the way of Bakas Island. Time and again, you will see them coming into the Nigerian territory to arrest Nigerians, and they will be taken to their country, and nothing will happen. Indeed, they will be released at their whims and caprices whenever they wish to. Well, now go to Accra, Ghana, where Beneth Joseph uh, is uh, live with me to unwrap her what the protest in Ghana has been about today. Good to see you, Beneth. Uh, quickly, uh, take us through uh, what went down today from the perspective of one who's on ground there. Okay, so we arrived at the protest ground at the Accra Mall in the greater Accra region at about 6 a.m. Ghana time. When we arrived there, the protesters were a bit scanty. They came in in their tents, and then it moved on to hundreds. And at the end of the day, the protesters had clocked around 1,000 protesters marching down to the parliament and to the presidency to submit two petitions upon which they were asking for an improved health care system for Ghanaians, security, and to abolish the system of corruption and impunity in the system. The protest was led by the national youth organizer uh, of the NDC, the National Democratic Congress, which is the major opposition party here in Ghana in the person of George Op Opare Ado. And so the, 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 protest, the protest, according to the NDC, was a very huge success, judging by the number of protesters that, protesters that uh, came out for the protest. And they believe that with what they've done today, uh, the Nana Akufo-led government would listen to their demands. Well, they call it D-Day finally, and uh, the talk about the police uh, managing this situation has uh, been top on uh, the conversation amongst Africans. Uh, how did this go today? Uh, did, uh, uh, were there abuses, or did you see a civil uh, Ghana police force uh, in action? Uh, Sulai, I must tell you that the image of the Ghanaian police amongst Ghanaians uh, is not one that uh, one would be proud of, uh, especially because of uh, uh, cases of human rights abuse that has been uh, meted out against protesters and civil rights activists. But the police forces were on ground today, and uh, to the best of my knowledge, they were coordinated and civil uh, to ensure that there was no breakdown of law and order. I also had the opportunity to uh, speak to some of the police officers myself, and they tell me that uh, they have been very, really impressed with the, with the conduct of the protesters. And they say that contra uh, contrary to what most Ghanaians think about the Ghanaian police force, that the Ghanaian police force are actually available to ensure that uh, the rights of Ghanaians are protected. And, uh, but again, like I said, the image of the Ghanaian police here on ground, from what the locals tell me, is uh, not so much to write home about. How were the protesters received at the parliament today? And was uh, the president, Nana Kufuado, uh, anywhere near the parliament uh, uh, today? Well, I, I think if you can hear me, Bennett, uh, because I understand there's uh, a little bit of delayed feedback. Uh, quickly here, I, I wanted you to tell us how the protesters were received at the parliament uh, earlier today when they took the uh, petition to the parliament. Well, the, the NDC were optimistic uh, that uh, they would have been received by Nana Akufo-Addo himself 
However, he was nowhere on ground. The protesters were received by the country's deputy chief of staff to whom they gave their petition. And of course, the deputy chief of staff in the person of Emmanuel Bosman said that he would ensure that the petition gets to Nana Akufo Addo himself. But I think that was a big disappointment for the protesters because they felt that uh, since the protests uh, had in, uh, in attendance members of parliament and, and top place government of belong to the National Democratic Congress, they had expected that Nana Akufo Addo himself would have come to receive them and address their concerns. But to their disappointment, they were received by the Deputy Chief of Staff. Uh, but the Deputy Chief of Staff to, uh, addressed the protesters saying that he would ensure that the petition which uh, they have brought before the presidency and to parliament uh, gets to uh, Nana Akufo Addo. And uh, before I let you go, um, what kind of message uh, has this uh, sent to the government of uh, President Nana Kufo Addo? Initially, they thought this wasn't going to hold, but now it is held. Uh, have you been able to get any feedback from uh, the, those in authority? Uh, I spoke with the national youth organizer of the National Patriotic Party, uh, which is the ruling party here in Ghana. They tell me that they believe that the wave of protests rocking Ghana right now is politically motivated. They believe that they have done well in spite of the challenges of COVID-19. But that's not the message we are getting on ground because Ghanaians say that Well, uh, well, apologies uh, for that uh, glitch uh, to that connection there. Uh, Bennett Joseph, my colleague who is live in Accra, giving us an update on uh, the series of protests uh, rocking uh, uh, Ghana in west of Africa at the moment. We we'll hope to get uh, more information from our team uh, in Ghana. Now, quickly to all the stories here, the, uh, the protesters uh, the parliament, uh, rather, the protesters uh, today went uh, to the National Assembly calling on lawmakers to dismiss attempts to ban the electronic transmission of results in the just concluded Electoral Act amendment exercise in Nigeria. They say they are to smuggle in a clause banning transmission of election results electronically by Nigeria's election umpire as worrisome and an attempt to promote fraud. Some of them condemned the parliament calling the decision a coup against Nigerians. Our correspondent Amadi Uyi has more on this. The protesters converged at the entrance to Nigeria's parliament, carrying several placards and singing songs of solidarity. When I remember, I remember the placards with various inscriptions spoke volumes and relayed the core of their message to the parliament. We have come here today to appeal to this National Assembly. We have come here today to tell the Senate President who failed to pass this bill by his own promise. promise. We have come to tell Mr. Femi Bajabia Miller who also promised that this bill was going to be passed. We want to tell them that this National Assembly will outlive them. Yes. But are they ready to leave a lasting legacy in this National Assembly? We're not asking for too much. It's not too much. We are saying that allow credible elections. Election. Yes. Give us and good electoral skills. Oh, yes. Yes. Let us know that whoever gets into mm. office is actually they have the will of the people, yes. have the mandate of the people, yes. not else. And I thought on this night in National Assembly. You have been infamous. You have been infamous. It is time for you, for even if you are known for one thing, nobody is 100% bad. Even if you are known for one thing, give Nigeria a credible election. The protesters were sending a strong message to members of Nigeria's parliament, urge them to do the needful in the interest of Nigeria's democracy. They also took time to relay their demands. We are saying this is a democracy. And the legislative arm of government is what makes it a democracy. Yes. And today we are demanding that transmission of, of results must be done electronically. Allowed to be done electronically. This is the 21st century. President Muhammad Buhari 
promised us when he was signing the not too young to run bill. He said, I will leave a legacy of good election for you people. What it means is that President Wamadu Buhari supports electronic transmission of results. Yes. Yes. It means that President Wamadu Buhari knows that he did not, he had to borrow money to buy for. Yes. Why will you not tell me to spend 15 billion to run for president? Mm. We say no! no. What, is what is painful about Femi Bajabi Amila and Dr. Ahmed Lawan is this? For years, they sought to be Senate President and Speaker. They didn't get it, and we saw the struggle that happened. But today, today, the Ninth National Assembly have given them the leadership of these two allied chambers to preside over the affairs of Nigerians. But all they do is not only to be a rubber stamp National Assembly, but also to conduct themselves in, in a manner that threatens the stability and the welfare of our nation. Simply because we are unable to have good elections, it will undermine the sovereignty of this nation. With Nigeria's Electoral Act Amendment exercise already completed, and the submission of the report by the Committee on INEC being awaited, Nigerians will be hoping that the Parliament listens to the voice of reason and ensures that the demands and agitations by concerned groups are captured and considered. From Abuja, Amadin Uyi, New Central Television. Still in Nigeria, Southern governors on Monday made security one of the main issues that they are determined to deal with after a meeting held in the southwestern state of Lagos. In a six-point communique, the governors frowned at what they believe is an encroachment of their role as the state's chief security officer by security institutions. They ask to be pre-informed if an operation is to be undertaken in the state by any security institution. Ijomai Sekhalai's report is presented from our studios. The Southern Governors in a communique on Monday after its closed-door meeting have demanded that Nigeria's federal government involve them in decision-making before invading or carrying out operations in the respective states. It would be recalled that security operators attacked the home of Yoruba Nation Rally Convener Sunday Adeyemo, also known as Sunday Igboho's residence, last month. Legal practitioner Barrister Liboria Soshoma says claiming that state governors are the chief security officers of the estate is also illegal, while insisting that the president alone is the country's commanding chief of armed forces. Retired Commissioner of Police Frank Odita had this to say. I want to believe that uh, the decision they took was right. Uh, the governor is the chief security officer of the state, and if anything is going to happen in the state that is not coming from him, he should be informed so that uh, the people of the state will be duly notified so that they can all cooperate. I think it's a very right decision to take. And I want to indulge that decision myself too. Barrister Liborius Oshoma sheds more light on the legal angle. Not just by words of mouth, they are chief security officer, not constitutionally. There is no way in the constitution that gives them power to deal with security issues. By words of mouth, they are chief security officer, but constitutionally they are not. And I think there's going to be any arrest or increase of um, a higher magnitude by the directly from the uh, Department of State Security or like the Army deployed by the federal government that are chief security officers, they should be aware, they should be in the know, which ordinarily should be until we amend our constitution to accommodate that we we'll continually have situations like this, especially given the fact that you have a president who is, uh, when it comes to these issues, he, he panders towards a uh, dictatorial or authoritarian tendency. Meanwhile, Nigerians are waiting for how the new declaration of the Southern Governors would turn out. Well, in Central Africa, aid workers in the Democratic Republic of Congo say children have stopped going to school in the eastern city 
of Uvira because of a recent spate of abductions. Now, this follows the abduction of at least five children aged between 6 and 14 in June alone. In one incident, a 14-year-old girl was left dead by the roadside. She was killed because her parents had not paid a $5,000 ransom. Another child was reportedly killed, one held and two been released. Now, the aid workers say it is unclear who is behind the kidnappings and the police are doing little to help. Now, in East Africa, the Somali National Army says its forces and Galmadog's regional paramilitary forces have captured Badwin town and other surrounding areas in a joint operation. The SNA on Tuesday said the early morning sting operation took control of Badwin town, uh, Kaysad village, Sabina, Gaurak and other areas which are Al-Shabaab strongholds after the militants fled. The SNA and Galmadong's regional paramilitary forces recently launched an operation to flush out Al-Shabaab's remnants hiding in small parts of Galmadog state. Now coming up, updates from the coronavirus across uh, Africa as Tunisia prepares to buy 3.5 million doses of Johnson & Johnson vaccines to boost its vaccination campaign. Details of this and more when we return. Stay with us. Well, if you just joined us, you're welcome. You're watching the Continental Prime here on New Central Television. Now, we go to South Africa where the former president, Jacob Zuma, will have to wait until Friday to find out if he will be arrested for contempt of court. Zuma had approached the uh, Pietes Marisburg High Court today to hold a court order that sentences him to 15 months in prison. Lawyers for and against Zuma presented their arguments. Zuma's lawyers argued that he shouldn't be imprisoned until he had a chance to make his case for freedom uh, before the Constitutional Court. In the meantime, the Commission of Inquiry into State Capture, which took Zuma to court to begin with, has argued that Zuma is trying to abuse the legal process. Joining me now to unpack this is Lawson Naidu from the Council of the Advancement of the South African Constitution. Uh, good to see you, uh, Lawson. Now, quickly, the former, uh, you know, the issue of uh, jurisdiction was a big part. Uh, the issue of the uh, jurisdiction was a big part of today's case. Why was this uh, so relevant? Sorry. Good evening, and thank you very much. Um, well, as you will know, uh, a week ago today, the Constitutional Court sentenced former President Zuma to 15 months in prison for contempt of court. Uh, he's launched two applications, one in the Constitutional Court, which will be heard next Monday, and the application that was heard today in the Peter Maritzburg High Court would sort a stay of the uh, implementation of that uh, court order sentencing him to a term of imprisonment. The key argument before the court today was whether the court, as a high court, had jurisdiction over a judgment that was handed down by the country's apex court, the Constitutional Court. And whilst there was a spirited argument by Advocate uh, Dali Mpofu, who was representing Mr. Zuma, uh, he seemed to be struggling to, to convince the judge, uh, uh, ju uh, Judge Mguni, uh, of the uh, ability of the court to have the jurisdiction to hear this case. A very compelling argument uh, uh, counter to that was advanced by Advocate Tembeka and Gukatobi on behalf of the Commission of Inquiry, who said that it was uh, untenable that a, a lower court could uh, uh, vary or suspend the order of a higher court. Uh, so that was a, a key part of the uh, legal discussion in Peter Maritzburg today. Well, anyway, uh, Lawson, some strong words uh, have been used, you know, in this, uh, you know, pushing the arguments for this case. For instance, the Commission's lawyers uh, also presented very strong arguments, uh, calling Zuma a constitutional delinquent. Now, what message do you think this case will send out to others? 
Well, I think, you know, the, the important part of the, this whole series of cases is that it confirms that South Africa is a constitutional state, that the rule of law is taken seriously in South Africa, and that we have a strong and independent judiciary who will hear uh, cases dispassionately and deliver judgments based on the, the law and the constitution, which is precisely what the constitutional court did last week. And this is just a further attempt by Mr. Zuma, as we've seen over many, many years now, to abuse, uh, to abuse the processes of uh, uh, the judicial system, to avoid having to account uh, for the very many mistakes that he made during his tenure as president, and his failure to account before the uh, Commission of Inquiry into State Capture uh, for, the, for that conduct while he was president. Well, no doubt we've seen quite a, a very, uh, you know, a spirited move by uh, supporters, especially those around his home state, uh, you know, fighting, you know, so hard to see that uh, justice uh, is evaded here. What can we expect going forward now that Africa and the world is looking to South Africa that has just set a, a very big, uh, you know, unprecedented ju judicial, uh, you know, uh, uh, judgment here? You know, I think we realize and recognize uh, both domestically uh, that this is a, a pivotal moment for South Africa and for the rule of law in South Africa. And we're also keenly aware that the rest of the world and, and the rest of the continent is watching uh, to see how this plays out in South Africa because, you know, we stand proud uh, by our constitutional democracy, the fact that the rule of law is paramount here. But if we allow to, Mr. Zuma to get away with this, it, it diminishes the strength of that rule of law. And, uh, you know, it's, it's likely to lead to other people who are convicted of similar crimes to, to also seek to disobey the law or to not cooperate with legal processes uh, and that way try to evade justice. So it is an important moment for uh, 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 South Africa, South Africa to, to step up to this. The courts have already stepped up and, uh, as I said, uh, delivered very strong judgments. It, it's now incumbent upon the, the government and in particular the police uh, to take action to ensure that Mr. Zuma is arrested and and put behind bars. There's obviously a lot of confusion now because of this, uh, uh, these new cases that Mr. Zuma has launched. Uh, but in the, the view of myself, as well as many other legal commentators, uh, the court processes currently underway do not in any way impact on the judgment unless and until they, uh, that judgment is overturned, which is very hard to foresee at this point in time. Lawson Naidu, many thanks for packing this for us. Sorry. Thank you. Now, the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights has expressed concern over the dozens of people reportedly killed and injured during protests calling for democratic reforms in the kingdom of Eswatini, uh, OHSCR uh, spokesperson. Uh, Lise Trussell told reporters in Geneva today that the organization has received reports of disproportionate and unnecessary use of force, harassment and intimidation by security forces. The OHCHR is now urging the authorities to fully adhere to human rights principles in restoring calm and the rule of law. We have received allegations of disproportionate and unnecessary use of force, harassment and intimidation by security forces in suppressing the protests, including the use of live ammunition by police. Some protesters were reported to have looted premises and set buildings and vehicles on fire, and in some areas they barricaded roads. We also call on the government to ensure that there are prompt, transparent, effective, independent and impartial investigations into all allegations of human rights violations. In And now to update on the coronavirus across uh, the continent, which begins with a general look at the figures across the continent. Now, the latest figures from Africa's Centers for Disease Control says the number of confirmed COVID-19 cases in Africa now stands at about 5.69 million as of Tuesday afternoon. The Africa CDC figures also showed that the death toll stands at more than 147,000 while 4.9 million patients across the continent have recovered from the disease. In South Africa, Morocco, Tunisia, Ethiopia and Egypt all remain the countries with the most cases on the continent. Now from a general look across the continent, let's 
tech updates from specific countries. In Morocco, the COVID-19 tally moved closer to 536,000 on Tuesday after 1,177 new cases we are registered in the past 24 hours. A statement by the Moroccan Ministry of Health says that the coronavirus death toll uh, rose by seven to more than 9,000, while 262 people were in intensive care units. The statement said the total number of recoveries from COVID-19 in the North African country was about 521,000, after 856 new ones were added. Now, east of the continent, 400 new COVID-19 cases were recorded in Kenya in the past 24 hours. That's uh, following the analysis of more than 5,000 samples for the disease. Tuesday's figures from the country's health ministry say the figures represent a positivity rate of 7.9%. The data shows the new patients comprise 220 males, 180 females, while the youngest is 12 years old and the oldest is 97. Now, the figures also showed that the death toll rose by 7. In the meantime, Tunisia has said it will buy 3.5 million doses of the COVID-19 vaccine directly from Johnson & Johnson. The North African country announced on Tuesday amid sharp criticism of the government for the slow pace of his vaccination campaign. So far, only about 592,000 Tunisians have received the two doses of vaccine in the country of 11.6 million residents. Just uh, since last week, Tunisia imposed a lockdown in some cities, but rejected a complete national lockdown due to the economic crisis. Now, authorities in the Philippines have retrieved a black box from an Air Force plane that crashed at the weekend, killing more than 50 people. Military Chief Cyrilito Soviano announced the retrieval of the flight data recorder on Tuesday. The military chief said the black box was retrieved on Monday and should enable investigators to listen to the conversations of the pilots and crew before the plane crashed. Soviano said no one jumped from the aircraft before it crashed, debunking earlier accounts from witnesses that some passengers had tried to leap to safety before the plane struck the ground. Now, an Egyptian court on Tuesday lifted a three-month-long judicial seizure of a shipping vessel that blocked the Suez Canal for nearly a week earlier this year, paving the way for it to leave Egypt. The Ever Given would now be allowed to leave the canal on Wednesday after a ceremony in the canal city of Ismailia. Now, the vessel ran aground in March, blocking the crucial waterway for six days. The Suez Canal Authority did not reveal details on the terms of the settlement. At first, the Swiss Canal Authority had demanded $916 million in compensation, which was later launched to $550 million. In addition to the money, local reports said the canal would also receive a tugboat. For the next of the business news, let's join Lecon on Obanjo. Hello and welcome to Business News on NC Continental Prime. I am Nikon Onobanjo. Ghana has announced plans to issue green and social bonds of up to $2 billion by November this year, making it the first African country to sell debt to fund development programs. The country, which is planning to borrow up to $5 billion on international markets this year, says proceeds from the bond sale will be used to refinance debt used for environmental and social projects and pay for education or health. The expectation is that the bonds will be issued in the fall and the maximum can be $2 billion. The country already sold $3.03 billion in March out of the $5 billion for which it has budget approval. 
out of the total of $3.5 billion will be used to refinance debt already used, while actual new debt will be $1.5 billion. Talking about Nigeria's debt now, the management office has offered for subscription of more federal government bonds at 1,000 naira per unit. According to information on its official website, DMO announced that the bonds were two-year federal government savings bond due in July 14, 2023, with interest rate of 8.35% per annum. There is also a three-year federal government savings bond due in July 14, 2024 at 9.35% per annum. Opening date for subscription is July 5, while the closing date is July 9, where the coupon payment dates are July 14, October 14, January 14, April 14, and July 14. The offer comes at 1,000 1, naira per unit, subject to a minimum subscription of 5,000 naira and a multiples of 1,000 naira, thereafter subject to a maximum subscription of 50 million naira. Away from that now, Saudi Arabia has welcomed the decision of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank Group to ease Sudan's debt burden. The debt relief for Sudan will be provided under the Enhanced Heavily Indebted Poor Countries Initiative through which a range of structural reforms will be implemented will be implemented to restore macroeconomic stability in the conflict's weary country. Last week, the IMF qualified the country for the heavily indebted poor countries initiative, a decision which means that $50 billion debt which Sudan owes will be forgiven. During the Kingdom's participation in the International Conference on Sudan in Paris in May 2021, Saudi Arabia provided Sudan with a $20 million grant to cover the financing gap of the country's debt with the IMF and announced that it would transfer its full share of the emergency and deferred charges accounts held at the IMF to Sudan for their debt relief. Let's also tell you that Kenya electricity generating company Kenjen is to benefit from its clean developmental mechanism projects earning an estimated $919 million Kenya shillings. This follows the issuance of additional 309,495 certified emission reductions for Kenjens or Korea to CDM projects by the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, bringing the total amount of issued carbon credits to 550,981. According to Rebecca Miano, Kenjen Managing Director and CEO, climate change has become one of the biggest global environmental challenges and has created an urgent need for mitigating its effects. Facebook and African fiber connectivity company Liquid Intelligence Technologies are extending their reach on the continent by laying 2,000 kilometers, which is about 1,243 miles of fiber in the Democratic Republic of Congo. The move will make Facebook one of the biggest investors in fiber networks in the Central African region. The cable will eventually extend the reach of 2A Africa a major subsea line that's also been co-developed by Facebook, the two companies said in a statement. The new bill will stretch from central Congo to the eastern border with Rwanda and eventually connect with Two Africa Cable, which is expected to be completed by the year 2024. And that's all on business news. Many thanks for watching. I am Nikon Onobanjo. The news continues on NC Continental Prime. Many thanks, uh, Lekon. It was uh, a good run. But unfortunately, it's come to an end for Africa's top female uh, tennis player. Uh, we have more uh, from uh, Onye Obaru. How are you doing, Onye? Very fine. Thank you so much, Sulai. Um, in the world of sport right now, it was a fight to finish for Tunisia's Anjibo as she lost a straight set to Belarus Arena Sabalenka. Awesome. Before Tuesday match, both Sabalenka and Jabbar had won a tour of um, 33 games in 2021. Now, looking further, we can say for sure that the Lito could separate them from the early exchanges. The Belarusian won 6 4 6 3 against Tunisia's Anjabar and being the first Arab woman to reach the last eight in the All England club. 23 year old Sabalenka, ranked fourth in the world, will play Karolina Pliskova on Thursday for a place in the final. The first batch team Nigerian contingent to the 2020 Olympics 
have departed Abuja for Tokyo. The federal government of youth and sport development said those who left through Namdi Azikiwe International Airport today include the canoeing and rowing team. Others include the special advisor on sports to the Minister of Youth and Sport Development, Mary Onyali, and the medical crew. The ministry said the second batch will depart on July 13. Nigeria will be competing in nine sports at the rescheduled Tokyo Olympic Games, scheduled for July 23rd and August 8. Nigeria's Paralympians will be competing in four sports from August 24th to September 5. In the meantime, Ray's Walker, Leboga and Shange, who was provisionally suspended by the doping violation, has been included in South Africa's Olympic team. Shange's case is set to be heard in the Court of Arbitration of Sports in Switzerland before the Tokyo Olympic Games, which will run from July 24th to August 8th, while the men's 20-kilometer race walk is scheduled for August 5. Shange, who tested positive for an anabolic steroid, was given permission to compete in the couple of um, competition last month in order for him to seal Olympic qualification. English Premier League side Liverpool has informed Egypt's FA that they would not release Mohamed Salah for the Olympic men's football tournament at Tokyo 2020. Chairman of Egypt's FA said Salah was keen to represent his nation in Tokyo this summer, but his, was refused permission by his club Liverpool. Clubs are not obliged to release players for the men's Olympic football tournament as the competition is not officially recognised in FIFA's March calendar. The Olympics in Tokyo run from July 22nd until August 7, a week before the start of the Premier League. Now, Brighton and Hove Albion have signed Zambian midfielder Enoch Mwepu from Red Bull Salzburg on a four-year deal for an undisclosed fee. The 23-year-old scored 11 goals in 81 league appearances and won four titles in four seasons with the Austrian club. Mwepu also won the Austrian Cup three times after moving to Salzburg in 2017 as Brighton's first signing of the summer. He is the second Zambian international to leave RB Salzburg from the Premier League this summer, following Leicester City £22 million signing of striker Patsin Dakar. Now, the Moroccan Bertola Pro League side, RB Berkane, has appointed former DR Congo manager Florida Benge in order to take charge of the first team. After an impressive 2019 and 2020 season, which saw them finish third in the American League and win the Confederation of African Football Confederation Cup, R.S. Burkani have been struggling this season. The Oranges were unable to follow or even qualify for the knockout stage of the Confederation Cup after finishing third in their group and are currently on track and missing out on the continental football next season. And there you have it, sport update at this time, we return course to Sulai to take over for the news bulletin. Well, very thanks, Onye. And uh, quickly, uh, but before getting to the weather, perhaps a lot of people should be asking what it is like in Lagos, Nigeria. Well, it's pouring, and uh, perhaps uh, that is why a lot of people should also be concerned about what we'll be looking at uh, in other parts of the continent. But quickly, let's look at entertainment and see what we have in the world of entertainment. Welcome to Entertainment News, where we bring you all happenings across the entertainment industry in Africa. Tonight on Entertainment, Richard Moffat Damijo at 60. Victoria Michaels wins big at Ghana Entertainment and Business Industry Awards. TIC honored at Spotlight Award Africa. Gospel music shouldn't decide line from winning awards. We begin in Ghana, where former board chair of the Ghana Music Rights Organization, Diane Hobson, has expressed concerns that gospel music is only aimed at spreading the word. According to Diane, gospel artists also go to studios, book sessions, and spend the night to write songs. They also commit resources into music and video promotion. The gospel artist outlined some contributions gospel music has made to the growth of Ghana's music industry. She stated that in the history of Ghana during the military rule, when a lot of people fled, it was gospel music that brought life music back. So if Ghana Music Awards recognize musicians for the work they have done in the year under review, gospel music should not be exempted. So the essence of my praise is on your grave. 
Good news for Ghanaians as Ghanaian music legend TIC have been honored at the mating edition of the Spotlight Awards Africa organized at the La Pam Royal Beach Hotel in Accra. The recognition was in honor of his outstanding contributions to Ghana's art and entertainment industry. Spotlight Award Africa is an innovative award scheme created to reward, celebrate and encourage young enterprising youths with exceptional skills and making an impact across Africa. CIC expresses appreciation to the organizers for bestowing such an honor in him and promise to continuously support Ghana music. <laughs> And still in West Africa, award-winning model Victoria Michaels has been honored at the maiden edition of Ghana Entertainment and Business Industry Awards 2001. The model was honored for her humanitarian activities and influence in the African fashion industry along other media personalities. She backed the Outstanding Humanitarian of the Year and the International Fashion Model of the Year. In her honor, the CEO of Fashion Connect Africa received a citation of honor for her unquestionable humanitarian service for the vulnerable, deprived, and marginalized people. Victoria Michaels, a modelpreneur who is the chief executive officer of Fashion Connect Africa, through the Fashion Connect Africa garment factory, with support from her partners, have donated over 400,000 nose masks to residents of deprived communities in Ghana to protect them from contracting COVID-19. And finally on Entertainment Tonight is the Big 60 for popular veteran actor Richard Mufet Damijo, popularly known as RMD. The talented Nigerian actor celebrates another decade today. Aside being an actor, he is also a writer, lawyer and producer. The former Commissioner for Culture and Tourism in Delta State has won several awards, both locally and internationally, and is widely recognized for his excellent delivery in movies. RMD took to his social media page to express gratitude to God for his journey thus far. Happy birthday, RMD. We love you. And that's it on Entertainment Tonight. Until next time, I am Chilima Wosu. Many thanks, uh, Chilima. Now for us uh, to see what uh, it is like in terms of sunshine and precipitation across the African continent. You already know what it is like here in Lagos, Nigeria. <laughs> As all others are, but before we go, let's uh, take another look at some of the top stories. Youth of Ghana's opposition NDC party have demanded better governance following their March for Justice protest. Now, South Africa's former president Jacob Zuma will wait till Friday to know if he will be arrested after he was sentenced last week to 15 months in jail for contempt of court. And finally, we told you that Tunisia is set to buy 3.5 million doses of Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccines. You can follow us on social media. We have New Central TV. You can also download our mobile app on App Store and Play Store. You can also watch New Central live on Star Times Channel 274, Avio TV Channel 23, Vision 247, Free TV and YouTube. I'm Suleiman. Uh, later, many thanks for watching.